I gotta get the door. Get the door. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for the ability to, to learn your word in a free country. Lord, we thank you for giving the Israel, Israelites the judges. When Moses and, and Joshua left them to go home, you provided them with judges. And boy, did the Israelites need them. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so Judges 3 and 4, we start to see the assignment of these leaders because, as we know, the judges in the Bible, they aren't like judges we have in court. They're just leaders. I shouldn't say just leaders, but they're leaders in the vein of, of Moses and Joshua. God, um, in his wisdom, decided not to select one person to lead the Israelites after Joshua died, he decided to select a series of judges for different reasons, as we're going to find out. They all had different personalities, and after the first couple, they weren't all that great. So we're going to find out who these judges were and how they function. So beginning in chapter 3, these are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites. Now the problem was, God told them when they went into the promised land, they had to get rid of all the Canaanite nations. God told them, if you don't get rid of them, they're going to cause you trouble. Back in Deuteronomy 7, God said, when the Lord, or Moses said, he was reiterating God's word, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally, make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy. They didn't follow God's directions. Some of the nations, when they took them over, they didn't wipe them out completely. Some, they, they kept the kings. Some, they just kept as slaves. They didn't do what God said. So now they're going to pay for it. Excuse me. Bless you. Ah, oh, thank you. Another reason that God did this is the Israelites, who are now in the third generation, they didn't know how to fight. The first generation came out of Egypt. They didn't know how to fight. They just knew how to be slaves. The second generation that Joshua was over, they learned how to fight. This third generation... They were in a period of peace. They didn't know how to fight. So God had two purposes. The first purpose was that um, they didn't do what God said. They didn't wipe out the Canaanites completely. Second reason is they had to learn how to fight. Verse 5. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. God was quite specific in Deuteronomy 7.3. Do not intermarry with them. Don't give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters to your sons because if you do, you're going to start following their gods. That's why it's very important that young couples are evenly yoked. Once you have um, a couple and one is a follower of, of Jesus and one's not, it gets tough. There's friction. You know, one one of the couples would say, "Well, I want to go to worship." The other one says, "Oh, you don't want to do that. I thought you were take me out to breakfast." And <laughs> problems start arising. That's why we go through premarital counseling, and that's one of the first questions I ask. Well, do you both go to to worship? Do you both go to church? What are your beliefs? And it, it's true with everything. It's true with faith. It's true with money. It's true with, with do you want kids or don't you want kids? Do you want dogs or cats? <laughs> Any little thing could cause a problem. You know? So we've got to be careful. So the Israelites didn't do what God said. They intermarried. They, they gave their daughters to marriage. Their sons married the Canaanites. And there was just trouble. 
And then we get to the first judge, Othniel. Verse 7. The what's Israelites his, did. What's his name? Othniel? Othniel. Oh, okay. Othniel. That's the way I'm pronouncing it. Okay. Um, could be pronounced different. No. Nope. I say Othniel because I took German in high school, and when the E follows the I, you stress the E. Maybe it's Othniel. I don't know. We'll have to ask him when we get up there. So the, the first judge, in, he, was, he was a righteous man. This was um, Joshua's nephew, I believe. We'll find out in a little bit. And he was a great guy. I think we find out a little bit more about him. Joshua let him marry... Uh, it was in maybe it was in chapter two. Joshua said, "Whoever goes and defeats this one group of Canaanites, I'll give my daughter to." And that's what Othniel did. So he's a righteous man. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asherahs. We know Baal. That's the primary god of the Canaanites. Asherah. That's another name for the uh, the chief female entity and it also happens to be Baal's consort or you know girlfriend so the Israelites worship these these Canaanite gods and the anger of the Lord burned against Israel so he sold them into the hands of Kushnan Rishta king of Aram Nacht whatever to whom the Israelites were subject to eight years what we're gonna find out as we keep going into judges is the period of um, oppression gets longer and longer. So here, notice that it's only eight years. And it follows the standard formula. They sin, they're oppressed, they cry out in verse 9, and then God gives them a deliverer. <clears throat> We've seen this formula over and over again in the Old Testament, and they're going to repeat it throughout Judges. Now the interesting in verse 9 that, that verb cried out. In Hebrew, Hebrew is just like Greek. The words are very descriptive. And they can say a lot. So this verb cried out, it means that all they did was complain. There was no sense of repentance in their, their uh, crying out to God. So God knew, well, you're my people. I'm going to to take care of you. And he did. Another thing we're going to notice, not only does the period of oppression get longer and longer, but God's response to the Israelites gets slower and slower. Because as Judges goes on, we're going to find out that their sin is greater and greater. So the whole book of Judges is just like a long descent into disobedience. The Israelites get worse and worse, they get more and more disobedient, so God gets slower and slower in his response, and a period of oppression lasts longer and longer. So if you're, if you're taking notes, just make sure you, you write down first depression lasts eight years, and we're going to see how bad it gets. Oh, wait, I have a question. Yeah. Who set up Judges? Was it Joshua before he died, or no, was it God? it's God. It's God. So do you think he regretted what he did? Never. Never. Okay. Because everything God does has a purpose. Right. So in setting up judges, he said, you guys need to learn a lesson. Because you're still sinning. I gave you the Ten Commandments. You're not paying attention. Got you're it. still sinning. You have to learn your lesson. We're going to see the same thing in Kings. Because he said, you don't need a king. The Israelite says, well, everybody else has kings. We want a king too. God said, okay. Well, the reason I asked, because you said God started to answer them. It took longer and longer for his answers. It just, uh, you know. Well, because they were getting more and more evil. Ah, okay. Okay. So, this, the, the whole book of Judges, we see the, the Israelites get worse and worse and worse. Okay. They started out mildly disobedient, and then they get really, really awful. Got it. And God answers answers their cries and he raises up Othniel as the judge. 
the Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. And the Lord gave Kushnan Rishayim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othni. You see this also. When we saw it in Joshua and we saw it in Moses. It's not the, it's not the, the skills of the Israelites in war that delivers them. It's always God. They can't do anything without God. Okay. That's why some commentators say, you know, back in the first verse where it says, um, verse 2, he did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites. They said, well, it wasn't really necessary because God helped them in all their battles. It wasn't their warrior expertise that got them through. Um, Home page. Ooh, another judge already. Yeah, they don't last long. At least the first couple. So what are we talking in years here for or um Oth Neal or Well, um so Oth Neal was um, around for forty years. Oh wow. So he conquered the king and in verse eleven we see that the land had peace for forty years. Until what happened? He died? The judge dies. Oh. Same thing. So, judge dies. There's no leader over the Israelites. So, what do you think they did? More evil. More evil. <laughs> exactly. Verse 12. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. As soon as the judge dies, they go back to their old ways. No wonder oh. God is getting aggravated. Oh. <laughs> you think God's getting aggravated with our country? Yes. I was going to say, this is right going right along. With <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You're yeah. right. It is. You know, it's, you wonder, when is God going to get fed up? When is, when is God going to have enough? But we have that clue. Matthew 14 tells us. Jesus says, I'll come back when the gospel has been told around the world. That hasn't happened. I don't see that happening for a long time yet until Christians get the right attitude and start spreading the good news. So if we want Jesus to come back, let's get busy. So, again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Because they did this evil, God gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Oh no, Moab. And Moab, we know how bad those oh, Moabs, yeah. Moabites are. G getting the... <laughs> yeah. Um... Hmm. Um, where am I at? When, whenever Israel's disobedient, God gives them over to one of their enemies. Oh, that's what it means. Right. So we're going to see that usually in different words. So whenever we see the Lord gave a king power over Israel, that means that king or that country has taken over Israel. Okay. getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him. So it's three countries taking over the Israelites. Um, the Moabites, Am Ammonites, and the Amalekites, and they were all nomads. So they were kind of always floating around Israel, and they were always raiding the Israelites. And this time God said, all right, I got enough. They're going to take you over. Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the City of Palms. Now, City of Palms was another name for Jericho at that time. So they're right along the border of the Promised Land. Because remember when they came into the Promised Land, they stopped in Jericho first. So this is part of the country that's just on the border of the Promised Land. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. So how long was the first oppression? Eight. Eight years. Eight. Eight years. Now we're up to 18 already. So they're getting worse. The oppression is lasting longer. So guess what happens in verse 15? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Once again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They're not repenting. They're just crying. They're just bawling. It's like when our kids do something bad and they whine. They're not mm. going to repent. They're going to do the same thing over again. Just like the Israelites. Ehud, 
a left-handed me. Oh, that was funny. Yeah. Why is that a big deal? It must have been an odd. It must not have happened very often. Right. It didn't happen very often because mo the majority of people are right-handed. <laughs> The interesting thing I found out, um, growing up Catholic, left-handed kids were always persecuted because the nuns wanted you to write with your right hand. Yep. So being a lefty was awful in their eyes. It's obvious the nuns didn't read the Bible because being left-handed in the Bible was a special trait. If you were left-handed, you were, you were like... Fantastic. My brother and sister are both left-handed. Yeah, well, they're different. They're not that fantastic. Oh, okay. I am. I am. You're lucky. Okay, so you're okay. Her brother and sister, they're not that good. But it, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So being left-handed, it, it kind of confused the other people when you were in a battle. So they're used to somebody coming at them right-handed. All of a sudden, someone's coming at them left-handed. That leaves their whole side undefended. So they couldn't. they didn't know what to do. Um, and there was a whole, whole bunch of Benjamite, Benjamites from the tribe of Benjamin who were ambidextrous. So they could shoot their bows with either hand, or they could use either hand in warfare, so that made them that much more powerful. So in this case, being left-handed was a super, super skill. And we're going to see why, especially with Ehud. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or Ehud. Probably Ehud. Yep. E -H -E oh, and he was the son of a Benjamite. Exactly. Hmm. Okay, so he was the son of a Benjamite. Now, Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long. Now, a cubit, it's, they said it's about 18 inches, so almost two feet. So it's a pretty, pretty nice-sized sword. Double-edged, so he can cut from both sides. So this guy knew what he was doing. And he strapped it to his right thigh under his clothing. Now, this is important because um, usually if you're right-handed, the sword would be on your left thigh. Okay, so think about that. His sword isn't on his left side, it's on his right side. That's going to be important in the next couple of verses. <laughs> he pres presented a tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. There's a reason for that, too, that we have the detail. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it in. So he sent off the rest of the Israelites. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, so these are idols, okay? And that's important um, because what the Bible is trying to get across is he left the, the idols behind him, okay? So he was a righteous man. He left the idols behind him. He himself went back to the king and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. So this guy Eglon was so egotistical, he says, oh, this guy's got a special message for me, <laughs> only me. So the king said to his attendants, leave us. He got rid of all his bodyguards, and it's only him and Ehud. Big mistake. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. So, so Eglon's thing is really important. As the king rose from his seat, he who had reached with his left hand, so he, the king's not expecting this, right? Because he's expecting a righty. So he reaches with his left hand, draws the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Ugh. He put it in so hard in verse 22 that the, even the handle sank in after the blade. He pushed in the knife that far that the handle was covered with the guy's fat. And his bowels discharged. This is also important. So what this means is the guy went to the bathroom right there on the floor. Okay. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed over it. Ooh. Then Ehud <laughs> went out onto the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. So Ehud is able to escape. Finally, the servants come back, and they found the doors of the upper room locked. Verse 24. They said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. 
<laughs> the smell was so bad from Eglon emptying his bowels after getting stabbed that the servants thought he was going to the bathroom. So they didn't want to they didn't want to break in on the king while he was going to the bathroom, so they just stayed outside the door. So by them waiting so long, the king died. This was one of the few times in the Bible where a fat man was mentioned. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. agree. It doesn't happen often. <laughs> He must have been really... Well, and, and you think how, how decadent he had to be. Because back in the day, they didn't have a lot of food. So this guy must have eaten everything that was around him. So Gary's right. Not a lot of fat people back there. So once again, Ehud gets away. He passes by the idols, once again, leaving the idols behind him, and escapes to Sirach. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Verse 28. So, not only is the king gone, they're now going to wipe out the country. Follow me, Ehud ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. Once again, it's not their military prowess that's going to defeat the, the Moabites, it's God. God is going to wipe them out. So they followed Ehud down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck out about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. How long was the first period of peace? Eight. Forty. 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 Now it doubled. It doubled. So God is pleased that Ehud did what he did. He not only gave the Moabites over to the Israelites, but the peace lasted for 80 years. So about two Would you consider 40 years a generation? Yep, yeah, they were saying Gary... Okay, you would be two generations. Exactly, two generations of people. Peace for two generations. But Ehud has to die, and Shamgar comes up. Shamgar of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Now this guy only gets one verse, but he's important because he got rid of 600 Philistines with basically just a long stick. We have a supplementary reading which explains what an ox goad is. And just think of goading somebody would be poking them, right? So an ox goad was a long stick with a...